Hey y'all, movie retrospective time. This was the one that won the poll this week. This is 1987's horror thriller, The Stepfather. Yeah, good throwback flick. You had not seen this before, Never had you? It. That was good. Yeah, I'm it surprised. Good, yeah. It's, it's weird because it's one of those movies that is like really, really good. And every now and then like someone will bring it up, but it seems like it kind of slipped under the radar. Like it has enough of a cult following that... It spawned two sequels and a remake in two thousand and nine, hmm. which you know I'll probably talk a little bit about later. It has a it has a good score. It has a real good edit. It's a fast paced story. It's got kind of like thriller slash slasher elements to it. It's good. Yeah. It's good. So I feel like the guy. Okay, so the guy that directed this, Joseph Rubin, um, I think he went on later to do kind of bigger movies like Sleeping with the Enemy and stuff like that. So I think what makes this movie so good, other than Terry O'Quinn, who plays like the main character, is because it was written by Donald Westlake, who, if you've never heard of him, I've read like a bunch of his short stories and stuff, but he's actually really, really well known or was because he passed away, but um, as like a crime and mystery writer, like, so he wrote a lot of thrillers and stuff. And he wrote the screenplay for this after reading about the very creepy and very weird case, which maybe we should do a show about one of these days, of John List, who was a dude in the 1970s. I think he worked as an accountant. It was in New Jersey, right? I think it was like 1971. And he lost his job. He had like this big, huge mansion, like that him and his family, I think they had three kids. And he was one of those real like uptight, he wore a suit all the time, like even when he was mowing the lawn and shit like that. And he was like super religious and everything. And he ended up losing his job. And he was so ashamed that he lost his job that he didn't tell his family and eventually ended up murdering all of them. Yeah. And then taking off. And they yeah. didn't find him for... 18 years something like that yeah, he was on america's most wanted wasn't yeah he, he was it was it was america's most wanted like yeah. and i think they caught him in 1989 it was crazy because i saw like a little bit of a thing about him today and when he when his case was on america's most wanted because they were still looking for this motherfucker um they had like a forensic artist like do a sculpture of his face and when they found him he looked exactly mm. like that sculpture mm. i mean it was yeah. creepily accurate if this movie, one of the things I liked about it a lot was, you know, other than the edit and the pacing, was the score. It was kind of like a, like one of those new, like a new retro wave. Yeah. Channel. Even though back then that was just That's what the, the, what the 80s it score sounds, sounded like. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds like a new retro wave channel. And then uh, something about the story and the tone of it kind of reminded me of, uh, remember Cape Fear? Yeah. With, uh, what's his name, Robert De Niro? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It kind of reminded me of, of kind of like a movie like that about a girl and her, it, yeah. her evil stepfather that shows up. And he just killed the, the family that he had before. It, it's it, it's a trip. It's a trip. Movie I trip. think this movie, it's interesting because I think the, at the time period that this movie came out, this came out in early 1987, I feel like a lot of horror movies were more slasher. I mean, slasher was kind of the thing that was in at the time, right? Yeah. So I feel like they made it more like a thriller and then they kind of marketed it that way, but they didn't really get a lot of interest. So they started marketing it more as a slasher, but it's really not. It's It does have some gore in it, and it is about a serial killer, but it's more like based on his psychology. And yeah. it's almost kind of like a family drama, except the dude's a serial killer. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's So it's much more like focused around dread and around you knowing that he's a serial killer but nobody else around him knows and yeah. you know that something bad's gonna happen and you're just like trying to you're kind of rooting for the characters to be like somebody needs to figure out like what the fuck this motherfucker's deal is so, like so you don't get murdered it's almost kind of like fatal attraction but to remember fatal attraction yeah, yeah. but with a guy who's doing it kind of reminded me of that it was from that same era there were movies that were kind of like this coming out yeah, uh, but they were just kind of coming and going, you know. I never saw this one, you know. Yeah, like really I said, it's stuck out. this one did okay. Like at the box office, it made like two, three million dollars. Um, you know, because it didn't cost like a great deal of money to make. They made it in Canada mostly, uh, even though it's supposed to be set in Seattle, like in a suburb. But I feel like it did okay. But it was one of those movies that kind of sort of got forgotten about. But then 
like I said, it was successful enough to get a sequel. They made a sequel in uh, 1989, which actually has your girl Meg Foster in it. Okay, yeah. Um, and he and he was in it as well, even though, spoiler alert, uh, you're pretty sure he died at the end of this one. But it's like, you know, it's a horror movie. What are you going to do? Um, they made a third one, too, which I've heard is not very good. Um, but they had to replace uh, Terry O'Quinn because he didn't want to do the third one. I guess yeah. because they were making it more like a straight-up slide. Or I think what ended up with the third one, they were just like basically remaking the plot of the first one. And he's like, yeah, I don't want anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, so that there was that whole issue. But, I mean, I feel like, you know, nowadays it's pretty common to do like a psychological thriller about a serial killer that's more focused on his psychology than it is about the gore but i feel like in the 80s it was kind of a new thing because i mean we just talked about henry portrait of a serial killer which only came out like a few months before this yeah and um so i feel like maybe those two movies in particular these two movies um are kind of like almost like pointing toward a new yeah genre like a, like new, a thing. new sub genre i can put myself back in those days and what how i would have felt seeing that seeing this movie for the first time back then you know what I mean? And it did, it does kind of fit the gestalt of the era. But I would have considered that to be like a new, a new type of horror movie back in those days. Yeah. You look at it now, they make a lot of this shit nowadays. Right, but, but back then back they did Back then didn't. it was kind of like a, the new wave of them. It was a good movie. Yeah. Good movie. Uh, there's something about it happening back in 87 too that kind of adds to it for me. If you had made this in the in the modern day, if like the setting was in the modern day, it wouldn't have been wouldn't have been as impressive, I don't think. Well, I kind of heard that that's what happened with the remake because they did do a remake of this in two thousand and nine. I haven't seen it; it's on Hulu. Um, but I was watching a dude, like kind of talking uh, at length about like all of the movies, like the first one and like all the original trilogy and the remake, and he said that while the remake is not awful he's like it just it suffers a lot from those kind of 2000s horror movies so they're just kind of like generic yeah generic. um you know it's just like a generic scary thriller movie and he's like another criticism that he had um and he's like and this is why it's instructive like to watch because he's like i really like bad remakes because you can then you can watch them both side by side and then you can figure out what it was that worked about the original yeah. that doesn't work about the new one. And he said, I think what's, what doesn't work about the new one is that it's not very long, but it's really like overstuffed. He's like, there's too many characters. There's too many, um, you know, side plots that don't really, you know, they don't really feed into the main plot. He's like, if you think about the original film, basically, he's like, basically there are three plot threads and they all inform one another, which he said, which is obviously that's like really good screenwriting because you're not wasting a lot of time. It's a very like efficient film um, and everything, even like shit that's going on with the side characters, you know, of which there are not very many, which he said is a very wise decision um, because you have more time with the characters. They're more fleshed out when you don't have as many of them. He's like, but even when they're doing shit in the side, it informs back into the main narrative that being Terry O'Quinn as the serial killer um, and the family, like, you know, the daughter being suspicious of him, the mom not being suspicious of him. And also you have the, the side plot of the brother of the, um, of the woman that he killed previously, like coming and trying to find the dude also, but everything is kind of like feeding back into the main narrative, which makes it a very, like I said, a very efficient. Cause I think it's only, I think it's 89 minutes, yeah. so it's, like, very, very short. There's something about it happening in 87, which makes the story a lot tighter, too, because you're not dealing with any kind of cell phones or social media, and it the, the, the story in the movie itself is a little self-contained universe, which yeah. makes it tighter, and it works better. There's just... If you try to tell this story in a modern context, it just wouldn't be the same. There, it just wouldn't. I feel yeah, and I feel like horror feel as claustrophobic or as restricted. Yeah, because reality was a lot different back then for any of you people that weren't around in the eighty seven. In eighty seven, you know, reality was very different. There just there wasn't an internet. There wasn't cell phones. There just everyone was kind of like uh, low information. You weren't stupid. It's just that the world was a smaller place back then. Yeah, information was. was harder to come by. Yeah. I mean, because if you look at this movie, because basically, I, I have to say that I think the opening sequence of this movie 
is one of my favorite horror movie opening sequences from the 80s. Yeah. Because how fucking great is that? There's no dialogue. There's no nothing. It's only like, it's four or five minutes long. It's just Terry O'Quinn. And he's kind of like, look, he's kind of got longer hair and a beard. He's like looking in the mirror. You think that he's just like getting ready for work or whatever. He's shaven and whatever. And then he, you know, cuts his hair all short. He cuts his beard off. He puts on a suit and tie. And he's like, yeah, look at me. Check me out. And then like he goes into the hall and he picks up like a kid's toy that got left out in the hallway. Then he slowly walks down the stairs. You see a bloody handprint. And then you see a whole fucking slaughtered family, including children, in the living room. And he yeah. just walks past it, walks out the door, and walks down the street just like he was a regular dude going to work. And he's just whistling Camp Town Races. Yeah. And it's like, so it the first four or five minutes of the film, they've established that this is a scary motherfucker. Yeah. And also that you wouldn't know that he was a scary motherfucker because he looks just like a normal person. Yeah, and see, and that was kind of a more plausible concept back in 87. A dude could kill his whole family and then change the way he looks and erase his identity. And change his name, yeah. And just walk out of there and start a new life somewhere Yeah, much else. harder to do nowadays. It would be a lot harder to do that now. <laughs> this facial recognition software would find you. You know what I mean? They, they have weird ways of finding you now. Yeah, you and know, I... Well, um, and, and the thing, too, is that... It's interesting because what hen what ends up happening is like you see that opening scene, which is so great, and then it jumps ahead a year, and he has you know moved to another town, but not that far away. It's still like in the Seattle area, and he has found like another widow, uh, you know, that has a child. Basically, what he's trying to do, and I think this is one of the most fascinating things about his character because he's very complex, um, and he conveys a lot of it without really talking like a lo he conveys a lot of it like with his facial expressions and stuff i like that they made him like his motivation i guess is that he wants the perfect family like on the 50s tv shows because mm -hmm. they show him at one point like watching mr ed and being like all amused by it and everything um but it's like the thing about it is that the realistic you know, a realistic family life is never going to live up to his ideal of it. And that makes him angry. So it's like, then he just like snaps and feels like, well, you know, my daughter, you know, the teenage daughter in this, uh, who's played by uh, Jill Shellen, who was, she was in popcorn and cutting class. Like later on, she was cut, cutting class was one of Brad Pitt's first movies. <laughs> like it was like a slasher. And I think she dated him for a little while, like back then, if I'm remembering correctly. But um, yeah, so, so the daughter's getting uh, in trouble because she, I mean, her dad has just died like, you know, a year previously. And then mom comes home with this dude which, you know, obviously that's going to cause some tension anyway. But the daughter, Stephanie, she immediately was like, this dude's phony. Something's the matter with him. And so she's kind of the only one that sees through his bullshit or through, you know, him wanting to have this fucking perfect, you know, picture perfect life, picture perfect family. But him being a psychopath and not being able to do that. So it's almost kind of like, and I like too, that they don't tell you at any point in the movie how often he's, how many times he's done this. Cause like they show him at the beginning, like killing that one family. And then he takes off and start, and you know, you, you're following this one family, uh, you know, at this point. And then, you know, when he gets pissed off with this current family and he's gonna, you know, kill them and he's, you know, made the decision you can see him setting up for the next one. Like he starts, he quit his job, but tells his wife he's still going to work just like John List did. But then he goes to like some other city, you know, gets a job there, you know, starts wooing this, you know, widow that lives next door. So you can see that he has like a routine of like what he does when his current family has disappointed him. Yeah. And it's like, so I, so it's cool because you're not really, it's really scary because you don't know how, like how many times he's done it before. Like he could have done it like whole bunch of the times and one you wouldn't enough, know. Though. Well, yeah. I think it was only once because of his age. And Maybe. how old the kids were when he, that he killed them. 
Yeah, maybe. The kids was about 10. So. But they weren't his kids. They weren't his kids? Okay. Well, that, but yeah, because that's yeah, what his whole a, thing was, was he wanted to insert himself okay. into an already existing family. Right, okay. So he would insert himself into a family where, I didn't catch that. I where the that. wife was widowed yeah. or whether right. there were, where the dude had left or something well, like that. Well, I know that. he did that the second time, but I didn't catch that, that he had done that the first time. Yeah, yeah. That's I what I he did as well. I thought that was actually his biological No, family. no, no. Right. That's, that was his whole thing. He like All insinuated right. himself into an already existing family and then tried to kind of like take it over so there was this like one and and he was kind of like portrayed as like the perfect psychopath because he you could see that he badly wanted that ideal like they show a scene of him like watching some of his neighbors you know like the the dad comes home and like the the wife and the kid are out there go daddy daddy yay they're like all hugging and kissing on him and stuff and he's like watching it like kind of wistfully um it's interesting because I'm not sure like how aware he is that he can't have that because he's a psychopath. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because he because everything about him is like a veneer. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that really clues Stephanie into him being I mean, she suspects that he's that there's something the matter with him even from the start because she thinks he comes across as very fake, which he does, um, but most people I guess wouldn't notice it. Is that he gets upset he's having this barbecue or whatever and then somebody shows him the newspaper uh article from his crime that he committed like a year ago because the brother tried to get like you know he's like you know they the cops have forgotten about it you know he gets a reporter friend to like insert another article about it like a year later so he gets like really upset he goes into the house and he goes down to the basement and starts like just flipping his shit because he doesn't know anybody's looking at him so it's almost kind of like he has this veneer, but he can't keep it up. So he has to like go down in secret and just like start hitting shit. And like, he's like wigging out and he can't like remember what identity he is and stuff like that. And the, and the daughter sees him and is like, oh, see, I knew that there was something wrong with that motherfucker right there. And also I think one of the best, um, I think one of the best scenes too is like near the end after pretty much, I'm, you know, the daughter like has figured out that this dude he throws her off the scent like a little while because she tells her therapist that she's afraid of him. So the therapist, to his credit, does believe her and is like, well, maybe something is the matter with him. Maybe something's wrong with this guy. So the therapist tries to set up um, a uh, a meeting with him. With him, uh, who's, His name is Jerry Blake in this iteration. And Jerry keeps dodging it because obviously he doesn't want like a psychiatrist like looking at him. So uh, eventually the, the therapist decides to like pull a little subterfuge and say, because Jerry's a realtor and he's like, hey, I'm so-and-so, I want to come buy a house it's just so he can like talk to him. And uh, yeah, poor doctor ends up getting killed. And so after that happens, but, but like I said, prior to that, um, it seems like Stephanie had really suspected that he might even be this killer that she read about in the paper, just because, you know, because of the way he acted and she thought it was very strange that he just like appeared kind of out of nowhere, like not too long after that crime occurred. But she, and this is another thing that's kind of going back to the old days, like before we had the internet, she didn't know what that dude looked like. So she had to write to the newspaper for like a headshot of the suspect, right? And... So what ends up happening is that Jerry finds the photo that the newspaper has sent her through the actual mail and he is able to switch the photo out with another one. So then for a while, she's like, oh, maybe he's not the killer. But then, you know, like I said, as it goes on, she does actually figure out that he is actually the killer. But mom is kind of clueless, which... I guess, I don't know. I don't know how, like, believable that is. I didn't because, think it's believable. Well, it, and I've heard that the sequels yeah. get even more unbelievable. The, yeah. They're, like, straight up, the women are just, like, idiots. It's just, yeah. like, the, the dudes are just, like, doing, like, obviously, like, huge red flag behaviors. Yeah, I mean, the dude was get, he, the, the dude was awful possessive of the damn stepdaughter. You know what I mean? It looks like he was looks like he was coming on to her a couple times right in front of the mom. The mom didn't even fucking re- notice it. That's what it seemed like to me. Like, I, I, like, like I get that... I found it like slightly unbelievable, but not that unbelievable because I could believe that a woman who had just lost her husband, like only a year before, um, and had a daughter to support. She was under a lot of stress, she was grief and everything like that. And then this dude comes along 
who seems like a perfect guy. It's like, oh, I can fix stuff around the house. And he like, I, he wants to take care of me and this and that and the other thing. So I can see her overlooking certain things that maybe in another, if you weren't in like such a desperate or, you know, emotionally vulnerable situation that you wouldn't overlook. So I can give it that. But like I said, I've heard um, that the, the, the sequels, part two and part three, they just made the wives like straight up idiots. Like well, it's the, like a plot device. It, like the dudes were, the dude yeah. was just doing like, obviously like psycho things. And they right. were just kind of like, Oh, well that's just what they do. You know yeah, what I mean? Well, that, would, that could help you push the, <laughs> the, the story along further and make it more over the top. You know, that's, that's probably what they were doing. Probably. Yeah. Cause I do feel like as it went on, I, they, they tried to kind of make it more like a slasher, but I like that. It's not like that. I mean, it's about a serial killer. There is some gore in it, but it's not real over the top. Like you do, like the doctor kind of gets beat to death with a um, two by four. That was a good scene. It was, yeah. yeah. Um, and the there's not really a lot of people get killed in it. I mean, other than the family at the beginning, you don't see that happen. You just see the aftermath, which is actually pretty gnarly. Um, and I like that they leave the shot. <laughs> I know this is gonna sound weird, but I like that they left the shot of the dead kid, like just laying there with the teddy bear, and she's all covered with blood and shit. Because normally they thought. Um, initially I think the producers were like, yeah, you need to cut that out because it's like a fucking dead kid. That's not cool. But they're like, no, we're leaving that in there. So they left that in there and I'm glad they did. But, um, yeah, so they, they get killed. The doctor gets killed. And then, uh, near the end, I love this. I love this. The dude that is the brother of the original woman of the family that he killed at the beginning He's been, this whole movie, he's been, like, investigating, like, trying to find out where the, where this motherfucker went, like, they killed his family. He's like, I know who the fuck it is, and he, and he figured out that he's like, oh, he changes his identity, so he might look different, but he can't be that far away. And so he starts looking for him and does this investigation, and he gets, he finds him, and he gets to the house at the end, and bitch gets Halloraned. Yeah. He he spends the whole movie finding yeah. the thing, I and he, about that and he walks into yeah. the house, and he immediately yeah. he tries to shoot the dude, yeah. and his gun gets stuck in his pocket or something like that, and then Jerry just straight up stabs yeah. him right I in the stomach. About that aspect of the story, and I think you know what I mean. You know what I think. I think when I was watching it again last night, because I've seen this movie a couple times, but I hadn't seen it for a couple of years at this point. Uh, because when that happened, I was like, oh shit, I forgot he got Halloraned, and then. The shot was like they showed it like in a long shot from the top of the stairs and then a close up like that. And I was like, I think that is a that is a straight up homage to The Shining right there, because that's how Kubrick shot yeah. Halloran getting killed. It was just kind of like far away, close up. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think they did that on purpose. Um, but I really kind of like some people might be pissed off by that, that Jim spent the whole movie and then like he just walked in and he's like, hey, I found you and then he gets stabbed yeah. and killed. But I kind of well, like that extra dude die somehow. I kind of like that because it showed how much of a psycho that dude was. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, and I liked it in the shining movie too, because even though I love Halloran as a character and he didn't die in the book, but I like that because it showed that even like all the effort that he put in, even though he had magic powers too and everything like that, that's how fucking crazy Jack was that he couldn't even like get past it. You know what I mean? Like he couldn't even get past the hotel. That's how evil that shit was. So I really, really liked that. So they did that in this one. And I'm pretty sure that that was a straight up homage to the shining. I'm not entirely sure, but I suspect it was, but yeah. So at the end of this, um, you know, finally, if it was me, like if I was the daughter and the whole time, like if my mom had like married some creepo like that and the whole time you're like trying to tell her, it's like, hey, he's a serial killer. And like mom is like, whatever, you're crazy. And uh, then it turned out to be true. Oh, my God, I would never let my mom live that shit down. So I don't so I don't know, like because the, the two of them were not in the sequels. Like I said, Terry O'Quinn was in the second one, which is crazy because at the end of this one, spoiler alert. He gets shot a couple of times and stabbed like right in the heart, pretty much. Doesn't Stephanie stab him right in the heart? Uh, yeah, I guess so. It looked like right in the heart. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure in the second one they were just like, Whoa, "Oh man, if it had just been an inch over, it would have killed you" or something like that. I'm sure yeah. they like have some kind of thing where they say that in the movie, but uh, I don't know. But as I said, um, all three of these movies, Stepfather one, two, and three, are all on Tubi for free. Uh, actually they might be on, somebody might have put them up on YouTube for free too. Cause I think I saw somebody put one on, put at least the first one on YouTube and, uh, the remake, if you're curious to watch that, I've heard it's not great, but you know, 
just in case you want to watch it, uh, that's actually on Hulu. So um, yeah, check it out. If you haven't seen it, it's kind of one of the most, kind of a real underrated thriller from the 80s and kind of developed a cult following like later on. Uh, but it's just one of those movies. I've Honestly, I think Terry O'Quinn, his performance in this like really, really elevates it. Like everybody's good in it and it's just like a good story and it's really creepy and I really, really like the approach that they took. Um, but I think he really makes this movie a classic because he's so fucking good in that role. And I feel like he's probably best known nowadays because he was on, he had a big part on uh, Lost. So I think that's maybe where most people nowadays would know him from. But because I think he did a lot more TV than he did movies. But he's just like fucking perfect in this. Like as a series, he's so, so creepy. And he's also, I don't want to say that he's sympathetic. Um, Cause I don't think he's sympathetic. He's creepy, but you understand why he's doing what he's doing, even though it's like a fucked up. Cause he has like a really fucked up, just like John List did. He had like a really fucked up ideal of what family life should be and everything had to be exactly perfect and exactly the way he wanted it. And if one thing was like awry, then it just fucked up everything. And he's like, well, I just have to like kill everybody and start all over again to see if I could get it right the second time. So I like that they had that kind of like motivation for him. But yeah, so like I said, all three of them, the original ones are on Tubi if you want to watch them. And the remake is on Hulu if you want to watch that for whatever reason. I don't know why you would. Uh, but yeah, check it out if you haven't seen it. Really good underrated thriller from the 80s that not a lot of people talk about. And I'm glad that this one was the one that everybody voted for this week because I had been wanting to do this one for a while. So uh, that'll do it for this movie review. We'll see you on the next one. Bye.